السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين My brothers, my sisters, it's a beautiful evening here in London, mashallah. Over and above that, this beautiful venue totally refurbished, mashallah. Say mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from one and all, all of those who made this possible and every single one of you who made an effort to attend this evening. I pray that Allah grant us acceptance and makes us from among those who are granted entry into paradise with ease. Ameen. In the last few days, I've been going through verses of the Quran in order to prepare for the month of Ramadan and the series that I have chosen this year is entitled Reconnecting with Revelation. And I can quickly explain why I chose that title. We know what has happened in the last two years. People have struggled, lives have been lost. People have lost in terms of health and wealth. People have lost so much and some have gained, mashallah. We as believers are always taught to look at the positives. I mentioned a verse in my talks in the last few days that is looked at by people without looking at the reverse of it, which is also correct. Here is the verse. It's mentioned more than once in the Quran. Allah says, If you're going to try and count the favors of Allah upon you, you won't be able to count all of them. That's the verse. If you are going to try and count the favors of Allah upon you, you will not be able to count all of them. Now, my brothers and sisters, yes, that's quite simple. It's very easy to understand that. But the reverse of it, if you are trying to count what Allah did not give you, you will be able to count it. Do you understand what that means? The favors of Allah are unlimited. The tests of Allah are very limited. Amazing, amazing, subhanallah. Ask yourself, why are you complaining? You're complaining because of five or ten things. But what do you have from Allah? A billion things. What are you complaining about? Adjust your life so that you can learn to live with what Allah has put you in as Difficult as it may be, he rewards you for the patience you endure. So he puts you through it because he knows for a believer, the ultimate goal is not success of this world, but it is success of the hereafter. And yes, as human beings, we'd love success of this world as well. I'm not one of those who's going to tell you, forget about this world. Don't achieve success. Sit at home, do your acts of worship, wait to die, die, go to paradise and you've succeeded. That's not what I'm going to say because that's foolish. Foolish in the sense that Allah made you a human. He's kept within you desires, likes, dislikes. He's put you within a community, society. Sometimes the norms in that community and society are quite difficult to live by. In which case you would always go back to the norms of Islam. Allah allows you to enjoy some of the beautiful things on earth on condition that you don't compromise your relationship with him. So if myself trying to enjoy what's on earth, in the process I'm earning the anger of Allah, I've got a problem because I'm a believer. This that I'm enjoying is temporary. And what I'm compromising is permanent. So this is why we say, if you were to count the favors of Allah, you would never be able to count them. But... That, that part is part of the verse. But the, 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 what I'm about to say now is not part of a verse. However, it is the reverse of it which is correct if you look at what Allah did not give you from what you want. All the challenges and tests that he has put you through, they are limited. They are limited. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. But they are difficult. So Allah says, look at what we have given you. So, as we've been through so much of loss, so much of hardship 
in the, in the process, at least we have come here today. At least we are able to watch this at some point. That means we have internet connection. That means we have the ability to have come to a function. That means we somehow have a mechanism of support, be it strong or weak, but it's there. Subhanallah, those are the favors of Allah. There are others who would never hear what I've said today simply because they have no connection to the internet, perhaps no device that would get them onto there, perhaps no home, perhaps no shelter, perhaps no clothing, perhaps no food. They don't even know what they're going to eat. And guess what? They are sitting in there under the tree in the darkness and perhaps with adverse weather conditions. And what are they doing? They are fulfilling two units of shukr to Allah saying, Allahumma lakal hamd. Oh Allah, you took away everything, but you didn't take away my iman. You didn't take away my faith. Oh Allah, provide for us. We have hope in your mercy. We are bearing patience. We are very patient. You know, patience is something like pain. The threshold of it is shifted and increased as you endure more. Initially, back in Africa, those who dig the fields, for example, they develop calluses and blisters on their hands as they hold the pick and start to dig. But what happens over time? I can tell you what happens. Your hands become what I would call weather beaten. You shake someone's hand. You know this person's been working hard in the fields. But they're okay. Initially, it was sore. Now, I enjoy it. Let me give you a British example. Go to the gym, mashallah, start doing your reps as we say. Start, you know, the bars and whatever else. And what happens to your hands initially? Imagine, look at the example. I firstly gave you an example that came to my mind was that of people toiling for real life and survival in Africa. For example, it's an example. And here, it's a luxury to be subscribed to a gym. Mashallah. It's a luxury. Masha and we have it and we're still complaining. Mashallah. Why? Just can't lose this belly of mine. Hang on. You've given birth to six kids. You're not supposed to lose everything, subhanallah, by the will of Allah. Those who love you will appreciate it and tell you, that's what I actually love about you. Uh oh, subhanallah. <laughs> May Allah grant us goodness and ease. But unfortunately, yes, there's pressure of society, pressure of friends, environments, so many other factors. But the point I was raising is you get used to that level of pain. And after that, it's no longer painful. Because why? The threshold moves. The same applies to sabr. When you get used to sabr, Allah starts you off with something small. Following year, something slightly bigger. The following year, something even bigger. And you start thinking to yourself, does Allah not love me? But Allah loves you so much, He wants you to endure so that He can give you paradise without a problem. Simple, you walk straight through. Things are going wrong in your life. That's according to you. According to Allah, it's going right. Think of it. You just went through some... The loss of life, the loss of a marriage, maybe through divorce, whatever else it may have been. A child, a loved one, a job. It's okay. One of those things. It's tough. We may cry. It's normal. We are human beings. We can feel the loss, but it should be cushioned by your faith in the Almighty. You know you have a conviction that dawn is to follow. The dawn is definitely to follow. So after all this, we struggled for about one and a half years, I'd say. Is it about two years max? And now what has happened? Everyone is reconnecting. Everyone is reconnecting with the life they were used to, right? I found it only apt to say, let's reconnect with the Almighty as well. And since the month of Ramadan is coming, the hope is this will be a Ramadan back to normal. Reconnect with the masjid. Reconnect with the norms of Ramadan that we were unable to do or engage in or participate in because of the last two years and all the restrictions. Here I am. I promise Allah I'm going to reconnect with revelation. Why? Because that's the Quran. The sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Reconnect as best as you can and you see how Allah will bless you as he granted you survival through the pandemic when others lost their lives younger than you, healthier than you, they went suddenly 
Surely we should reconnect with revelation. We don't know what may or may not happen as the days pass. My beloved brothers, my sisters. So I started going through verses of the Quran, simple verses with simple lessons in order for us to be reminded because I'm sure we've heard so many reminders from the Quran and from the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but we should continue to hear the reminders and it should be over and over again because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to continue reminding for the reminding benefits those who believe. Your prayer times are known. You've been praying for the last so many decades or years. But every prayer, Allah's instructed someone to call to remind people, hey, it's prayer time. Thought about it? If reminding was not beneficial, you would never be hearing the adhan or having a reminder to say, Hayya ala salah. Come to prayer. Five times a day. It's repeated. We would have been taught to say, hey guy, it's enough. You told me once, now that's okay. But in fact, we should enjoy the reminder. That's a Muslim. Why is it we get upset when people correct us or remind us regarding our duty with our, or towards our maker? Why do we get upset? Don't be upset. Even if you're weak, say, Jazakallah khair, I know I'm weak, inshallah, pray for me, and so on. And it's not just pray for me. I mean, you can't have a bottle in your hand and you have, for example, something else and you're doing the worst haram, haram, haram stuff. And then someone says, but you know, intoxicants, you know, you're not supposed to really be. No, just pray for me. Allah will guide me. That's a statement of arrogance. Don't say that. Just thank them. Jazakallah khair. May Allah guide us all. And who knows, if, do you know one day I was delivering a lecture in a city, some of you might have heard this, and I spoke about jewelry for men, gold and, and, and you know, jewelry basically for men. Mainly it was the gold, like the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith says he was seated one day and he had gold in one hand and silver in the other. And he said, Inna hadayni haramun ala dhukuri ummati. These two are haram for the males of my ummah. So if you consider yourself from the ummah, you would consider those two haram to don, to wear. And so I was mentioning in the hadith of the benefits of quitting something for the sake of Allah or doing something for the sake of Allah. And I just happened to mention how some people wear gold chains and so on. And I said, you know what? As much as we don't judge people, but it's not wrong for us to tell someone to say this is permissible and this is prohibited. I'm just making the ruling clear. There was a brother seated not so far from where I was standing and speaking. And he pulled his gold chains off. He took his earrings off. He took his rings off. He made a pile and left it in front of him mid-speech. It's been almost 15 years. He's one of my best friends. He's one of my best friends. It's the first time in my life I had seen instant response to a word of encouragement and advice. And I was motivated because according to me, when we correct people, they feel upset. They come back, were well, you attacking me, by the way? Bro, I don't even know you, man. What was I supposed to be? You know, when I tweet, people say, do you know me? Have you been following? No, I follow myself. Subhanallah. I don't even follow you in that sense. I don't even know who you are. Besides being my brother or sister in faith. But I tell you, because I'm going through, as a human being, challenges, I can imagine what you are going through. We have five fingers. If I said all those with five fingers are human beings, I mean, you're going to say, how do you know me? I have five fingers too, come on. May Allah grant us ease. So to reconnect in this way is something beautiful. The reminders. And as I was reading these verses, preparing for these beautiful reminders of the series, reconnecting with revelation. And why did I use the term revelation? There's a reason. It's more attractive for those who perhaps are not Muslim. 
you might not understand what I've just said. If you have a series reconnecting with the Quran, automatically you've deleted people who are not really keen on Islam. But if your da'wah goes beyond that, you start thinking of how would I use words that would be more palatable to those who really need to hear it. And so you use a terminology that's not wrong. It's just a different language. We said reasons of revelation. And then in fine print we said of verses of the noble Quran. Fair enough. But here we're saying reconnecting with revelation from the almighty. Because we all need it. And guess what? Now I get to the point I was making as I'm reading the verses. A few stories Allah has mentioned in the Quran. Of great motivation to all of us. One of them is. Ibrahim alayhi salam. The prophet Abraham. One of the most loved unto Allah. He was known as Khalil Allah. The friend of Allah. Why was he known as the friend of Allah? Because. Allah tested him and he passed every test. He followed the instructions blindly. That was the gift of Allah. Subhanallah, amazing. He passed every test one after the other. My brothers and sisters, Ibrahim alayhi salam, one day left his child Ismail and his wife Hajar, may peace be upon them, in a desert where there was no water to begin with. If there's no water, there's no food. There was no water. There was nothing. It was a desert. Arid. Sandy and rocky. And what did he do? He started walking away. His wife, knowing the loving man, the kind man, the man who fulfills the rights of his family and so on. She knew there's something happening here. We're traveling, we've come to this valley. We're left with not much, there's no water, there's nothing here, there's no people. And this man is leaving me. And my child, a child he loves because he got the child after years of trying. Years. Allah blessed him with a child later on in his life. He was much older. And so she asked him a question. Did Allah instruct you to do this? The answer was in the affirmative. Yes. She knew that's it. Allah will take care of us. What and how? I don't know. But the conviction, it's there. Conviction is probably one of the most powerful, powerful acts of worship that would cushion the problems that you face, the issues, the difficulties, the hardships, and they would make you look forward to a solution or the solution. And at times, the solution may be delayed, but the conviction will keep you afloat. So when things are not going your way and every one of us has different challenges in life be convinced that allah has the solution and it is coming when the time is right it will come and if the time is not right on earth trust me you're going to get something amazing in the hereafter but you're going to have to bear patience with the conviction conviction alone would not get you to the optimum level of ease but you need to bear patience and together with that there is one more thing Allah's given every one of us a capacity. He's given us strength. He's given us some form of ability. You need to use that capacity, the ability and your strength to try to achieve what you want to achieve and what you need to achieve. I want to go to Saffron, for example, on Thursday night. I need to make a plan. No matter how much conviction I have that Allah is going to get me there, if I'm just going to sit at home without making an effort, I'm not going to get there. Not at all. Maybe a miracle might happen, but you know, these days we're not saints on that level. Subhanallah. You need to make an effort. So make the effort and be convinced. Inshallah, Allah will guide my effort towards achieving something. And if you did not make it for some reason, guess what? Just thank Allah. Oh Allah, you saved me from something bigger. We were delayed not too long ago on one of my journeys. And when we finally got to leave, 
People were complaining, hey, we're late, we're late. I said, no, don't worry. Perhaps Allah knows something. It's okay. I was asking Brother Shakil, you've known me for many years. When last have you seen me angry? He said, nah, I haven't. Just the one something happened and you know what? Because why? You have to hand your affairs to Allah. Be convinced that whatever's happened, you know what? I don't understand it. It might not have been so good, but it's okay. It's Allah in charge and in control. Come on, that conviction. Bear patience with it. As we were traveling, we saw a massive accident where there was a fire. And the cars were in flames. And I thought to myself, had we been five minutes earlier, perhaps... We may have been a part of this mangled metal that you can see. So that was Allah. He delayed you. It's okay. No problem. Someone's being difficult in your life. It's okay. Allah will create ease in other ways. Allah will give you little successes that wouldn't have come in your direction had this one come to you. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, his wife Hajar was convinced she had that conviction, number one, number two, she was patient. And number three, she used her energy to get up and start the search. What are you searching for? I don't even know. What are you looking for? <laughs> I don't know. Tell us again, what is it that you want? Well, I'm going up Mount Safa and then I'm coming down and I'm going up Mount Marwa to try and see if there's any sign of life. If there is a single bird in the air, I'd be able, or in the sky, I'd be able to know there's water somewhere. I'd go there. That's how intelligent they were. If you and I were in the desert, well now, had it not been for that story, I wouldn't have known. If we were in a desert looking for water, we wouldn't bother looking for where the birds are. Unless you're an expert. Bird watching, mashallah. My my brothers, my sisters, here is a woman. She's making an effort. Allah loved it so much. So much. Because you know what? You don't even know what you're looking for, man. And you know what? You've left it to us. You're convinced and you're patient without complaint. Allah says, we're going to make this memory eternal. The Hajj will be compulsory upon everyone who can manage right up to the end of time. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to make them run through Safa and Marwa and they won't even know why. Why do you run through Safa and Marwa? Have you thought about it? Because it's the instruction of Allah. That's the answer. I want to ponder over what a woman did in order to survive with her child. How many women are taking care of their children single-handedly? They suffer, they struggle to make ends meet, to meet deadlines, to help them go to school, to come back. to, And they face all the difficulty and hardship. This is a day we pray for you. May Allah grant you success in every way. May Allah take you to paradise without reckoning through the green route. May Allah Almighty open your doors and fling open the doors of his mercy for you. It's a struggle today. Tomorrow you shall smile. It's difficult. Where do we get this from? The story of Hajar and Ismail. Guess what? Miraculously water started gushing. Water started gushing. And it didn't just gush for a little bit. It gushed in such a way that it kept on flowing. And it kept on flowing. And you and I who are Muslims who have been to Mecca have actually seen this well. What was it? The effort of a woman. The conviction and the patience. If I am convinced about Allah's plan for me, and I try my best to achieve what I believe is beneficial. And I bear patience upon what happens in the process. Allah will open your doors. But you know when? When the time is right. It wasn't one round. She didn't just go Safa to Marwa and suddenly the water gushed. No. Allah knew the water was going to gush. How many times? Seven times. Subhanallah. That could depict seven days, seven months, seven years for me. You might have a problem for a few years. If I want that number seven, in Yusuf alayhi salam story, the same thing happened. The dream of the king that was interpreted by the Prophet Joseph, may peace be upon him. He says, you will see seven years, seven years, wherein you will have great 
produce. MashaAllah. And then seven years of drought were in which you will eat from that which you saved during the seven good years. And that teaches us that you should save up a little bit for the future. In case there is a rainy day, you need to have a little bit that you can tap into. So seven rounds and the water gushed out. Wow, don't we owe her a lot. Well, even if you don't want to acknowledge Allah has made it incumbent upon us and Allah has done something else. Ibrahim alayhi salam, as he was leaving his family and by the way, no man can ever come today and say, I've just left my wife and children to fend for themselves because I'm just following the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam. I've actually had one case. I was uh, an arbitrator in a problem and the man was so such a religious guy with such a nice mashallah you know long bed and so on uh, I don't think he would miss the hajjud but he actually told me that look Ibrahim alayhi salam did it you know I said brother are you a prophet of Allah did Allah instruct you to do something like there was another case where a guy comes up and says you know Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, my father told me to divorce my wife I don't have a problem with her but I divorced her I said but why because my father told me, I said, your father, you're a man on your own. I would inform my dad rather than ask him at this juncture. I mean, I'm close on to 60. Come on, guys. In a few years. <laughs> a few decades. <laughs> but my brothers, my sisters, I tell you, it's a fact of life. You are not a prophet. If Ibrahim alayhi salam, according to one narration, went to his, his son or he, he told the wife, you know what, tell the owner of the home that when he comes, he needs to change the, the doormat. So when Ismail alayhi salam heard about it, he said, that was my father telling me to divorce you and you can go home. That was a prophet of Allah. If at all that narration is correct, it was a prophet of Allah. Yes, indeed. And if a prophet is, is told by Allah, they wouldn't say something from their own pockets. But if your father comes to you and tells you to divorce someone you have no problem with, you love them, you tell your dad, goodbye, salam alaikum. And you walk towards your wife. So what if they call you whatever? You have taken her with the name of Allah. You don't do that. We, we love our parents. We will respect them. We will be kind to them. But never did Allah say, obey them when they are unreasonable. Not at all. One of, some of the difficulties we have today are based on the fact that sometimes we just follow what's unreasonable. We know. But we say, that's my father. I cannot replace him. That's my mother. I cannot replace her. But you, I can replace you. What a statement. What a fraud. What a blackmail. May Allah Almighty protect us. So my brothers, my sisters, let's try and understand. Here is a woman... She is going through whatever she is going through. And Allah blessed her with so much that she decided, subhanallah, we're going to share this. We're going to share this. You know the meaning of zam zam? Do you know the meaning of zam zam? Can someone say it? Stop, stop, stop. That's how much Allah is giving. You know, when I sit and I read Surah al duha it's a surah in the Quran. Allah is telling Muhammad, peace be upon him. These people are not appreciating you, but we want to tell you, we're going to give you very soon more than you can imagine until you are happy. Very soon your Lord is going to open your doors and grant you and give you until you are happy and even beyond. Imagine you crying for a job. Let me say something funny. And suddenly Bitcoin hits through the roof and you had five coins. MashaAllah. You've got such a surplus, you started employing people. May Allah grant us better than that. Say Amin. Come on, guys. I see you guys are into crypto. That Amin was quite loud. My brothers, my sisters, the point I'm raising is sometimes we're crying to Allah for a job. And it happens to last four, five years. There comes a point where Allah doesn't just give you a job, but he gives you so much that you become an employer and you have surplus and you need to share and you become a giver and you donate, whether it is subhanallah here or there, whatever it may be, and you give for the sake of Allah and you didn't even have the ability and capacity. You were crying for a simple job, but what was it? There were three qualities. You need conviction, you need patience, and you need to make an effort. 
If you're lacking any one of those, it's going to be difficult during tough times. So she decides we're going to share. Do you know what? As Ibrahim alayhi salam was leaving, he made a prayer. Because he did it for the sake of Allah, right? So as he's going, he says, Oh Allah, this place that I've left this, my family in, it's a valley. Make it into a beautiful place that people's hearts would like to come there. Who wants to go to Mecca? Who wants to go to Mecca? Put up your hand. Thank you. Put your hands down. May Allah take us there. May Allah gather us there. MashaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly take us there again and again, not only to learn the lessons which we forget a lot of the times, but this is a result of a prayer of a man who was the friend of Allah. And we feel it, we know it, we see it, and we live it. He said, Oh Allah, let the hearts, Ij'al af'idatam minan nas, tahwi ilayhim. Let the hearts of the people be inclined towards them. The hearts are inclined. He says, Urzukhum minat thamarat. Grant them from produce. You go to Mecca. Any of you have been to Mecca, you probably have entered any of the stores there. Do you know what? Fruit from across the globe doesn't even grow there. It's there. Go and check. You can buy bananas from Mexico. Mangoes from India. What else? Grapes from South Africa. And where are you? I'm sitting in Makkah saying, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah. And Allah has just thrown everything at your feet. There we go. What happened? That sacrifice, I want to tell you today, Allah loved it so much. That's why you reenact it in Hajj, the fifth pillar of Islam. It is not an action of a prophet that you are reenacting. The initial action was not that of a prophet. It was that of a lady, a woman who was so trusting of Allah, so convinced, she knew Allah will provide. My brothers, my sisters, we have smaller problems, but we're not that convinced that Allah will provide. Or we don't go out and make an effort. She was a woman. She went, uh, she made an effort. People came in. Jurhum is a tribe that came in, mashallah. And thereafter it grew, it grew to a city. And it grew to such a huge city. Just Google Earth it and check it. It's amazing. So that was one beautiful story that i felt i'd share with you in order to motivate all of us to have this conviction to develop it to trust the almighty yes each one of us has our own unique story we were born in a certain way to a certain family in a certain place that's unique on its own and we have a story regarding that as we grew older we have a story about our folks maybe our fathers maybe our mothers maybe our relatives maybe the way we grew up the schools we went to the environment we lived in perhaps maybe abuse may allah protect us and all the others but each one of us has stories sometimes a little bit traumatic and the trauma plays out later on in life at times and people don't know why is he acting this way why has she done this but there's something that's happened far behind that no one knows about and now subhanallah this is a result of what happened may allah protect us you have your unique story do not be embarrassed of who you are today but the only thing i can tell you is work towards becoming a better person don't let anyone make you feel you're not good enough to turn to the Almighty. He loves you and He knows you personally. That's the thing. He knows you better than you know yourself. The other day in the masjid, I asked a question. Who from amongst you knows names of eight generations of your grandfathers? Put up your hands. I'd like to know here. Eight generations. You name yourself, your grandfather, and go back eight generations. Anyone here? I see one hand. Any other hand? Two hands. Eight generations. Okay. Anyone else? I saw a sister at the back. Perhaps, maybe. So let's say three from amongst us or two from amongst us. What about the rest of us? And those who do know the eight, or oh, there is someone here who also knows eight, but he knows more, more than eight. How many? How many? How many? Five. Five. Ah, that's good enough, mashallah. But I tell you what, even those who know eight, a lot of them wouldn't be able to go beyond about 10, 12 maybe. Unless you have a sacred lineage, then you would know it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Those with a sacred lineage that goes back to a prophet of Allah, they would know what the 
the lineages. And by the way, I said it the other day, it was awesome. I'm going to say it again. Did you know that you come, all of you, come from the lineage of a prophet? Did you know that? What's his name? Nuh. His name is Noah. That's confirmed, like confirmed. So, you know when people are getting married, sometimes they say, you can't marry my daughter because we come from the family of the prophet. Well, I tell you what, there's nothing in Islam that says you can't. It's just you and your culture. But anyway, you can bring back a beautiful comeback and say, well, I'm also from the family of a prophet. There it goes. I'm teaching you how to speak, okay? We've solved a few problems like that, guys. So I'm from the family of a prophet. Who's the prophet? Noah. Wasn't he one of the five uh, highest of the prophets together with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? So anyway, now we can get, get on with the nikah, inshallah. <laughs> my brothers, my sisters, you realize that these generations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created us. Everyone I was saying has a story. You are unique. You are amazing. You are awesome. Allah knows your lineage going all the way back to Nuh alayhi salam and you don't know it. So, so what would happen? It's Allah Almighty who will take care of you. He will. The only thing I am allowed to say to you is words that would encourage you to get closer to Allah. But I'm not allowed to belittle you no matter what. I shouldn't. No prophet has belittled his people. Look at the prophet Lot. When he called his people, he told them, Oh my people, why are you doing what you're doing? For example, he didn't swear them and shout them and belittle them and, and so, no. Look at the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, addressing mushrikeen. And what did he say? Oh my people, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent the angels to listen to the instruction in Ta'if when they were throwing stones at him. Do you know what he said? Allahumma qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, guide, our, guide my people they don't know. Guide them. Oh Allah, guide them. Subhanallah. So these are the words that we should be using. And that's why I say, not just myself, even amongst ourselves, we use beautiful, empowering words, mashallah. Allah will bring you. Sometimes we struggle because Allah Almighty wants us to find Him. Sometimes He wants us to find Him, to shed a tear. Do you know that there are people in your midst, in your lives, in your communities, perhaps maybe even in your families, outwardly you wouldn't imagine that they are perhaps closer to Allah than you would have thought. And I'm in no way encouraging people to discard the goodness of their appearance, but I am saying, don't judge. You don't know what's going on. How many are the opposite where you see them, they appear so saintly, and you find them engaging in behavior that is totally unacceptable. That's true as well. Let me give you the second story before I end. That's another woman, amazing woman. I was reading these verses today. Like I said, it's part of the series that I've thought of this Ramadan which is entitled Reconnecting with Revelation. In Surah Al-Qasas, where the story is mentioned of the Prophet Moses, may peace be upon him in his childhood, Allah Almighty goes into a little bit of detail about the mother of the Prophet Moses. And Allah Almighty says she was worried about the child because the Pharaoh was executing and killing the little babies every alternate year. This child was born in the year when they were doing that and so she needed to hide the child and from who? From the Pharaoh. And Allah says, we inspired her to do something. So she had the conviction. What else? She was patient. What else? She made an effort. They made a basket. They put the child in, put the child into the river. Tawakkalna ala Allah. We lay our trust in Allah. Little did they know that the same person whom they were fearing would execute the child was the one who was going to bring up that child. The wife didn't bear children according to some narrations. She picked up and said, 
what a beautiful baby. We need a baby. May Allah grant us ease. They claimed the child, but that was Allah's plan. Allah wanted him to have the best possible upbringing. And then Allah had inspired her and she was convinced that Allah will never separate a mother from a child. You know what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says? He says it clearly. Whoever separates a mother from a child while she is unwilling, Allah will separate that person from his or her loved ones in this world and in the hereafter. There you have it. People do it after divorce. People do it after so many things. Allah says, you separate, we will separate. Don't worry. Tit for tat. And we will come back in a harder, harsher way. So watch out. Have a big heart. Let things happen as they were supposed to. Parents shouldn't be separated from their kids. Not unwillingly. So Allah says, فَرَدَدْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ أُمِّهِ كَيْ تَقَرَّ عَيْنُهَا وَلَا تَحْزَنْ That's a part of the verse. We returned him to his mother. No one could suckle the child. And they found someone who was it only one person in the entire place could suckle the child. And that was the woman. Little did they know that's the mother. Subhanallah. Allah says, we returned him to his mother so that her eyes could be cooled once again by her own child. And so that she knew. So that she wouldn't be sad. And so that she would realize that the promise of Allah is the truth. That's the second part of the verse. وَلِتَعْلَمَ أَنَّ وَعْدَ اللَّهِ حَقَّ For her to be convinced that you know what, the promise of Allah is the truth. I'm telling you today, Allah's made promises, they are true. You need patience, you need what I told you. We've seen it happening. Be patient. Then Allah caps that verse by saying, وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ But unfortunately, many people, many of them don't even know. They don't know. People don't know. They don't realize. People don't believe. May Allah Almighty grant us goodness. So that's very inspiring to see. We went through the challenge. We went through the hardship. There was anxiety. There was a lot of stress, I'm sure. But you know what cushioned it? What cushioned it for me was the conviction in Allah and the fact that I believe nothing can happen unless Allah has willed it. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told this young man, the Sahabi radiallahu an, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, you know what? اعلم أن الأمة لو اجتمعت على أن يضروك بشيء لم يضروك إلا بما قد كتبه الله عليك. You should know and be convinced that if everyone in the nation gets together to harm you, they won't be able to harm you unless Allah has written that against you. They can't do a thing. سبحان الله. That's the conviction. So my brothers and sisters, as I got up, I asked Brother Yasin. Do I speak for 45 minutes? He says, yes. Guess what? I've clocked my 45 minutes. There's just about a minute and a half remaining. May Allah Almighty bless you all, grant you goodness and ease. We spare a moment to pray for those who are struggling and suffering across the globe. There are so many who are going through a lot more than we are. There are so many who have real life challenges. We are sitting in a favor of Allah but we're still upset, we're still complaining because a few of the small things in our lives are not in place. Perhaps we may not have a thing or two. Like I said at the beginning of this talk, count the favors of Allah, you won't be able to. Count the challenges Allah's put in your life, you will definitely be able to count them because they are limited. Allah will never give you an unlimited number of problems because he knows you're just a human being. So bear patience, turn to Allah. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu sta'inu bi sabri wa salah inna allaha ma'as sabirin O you who believe seek assistance help yourself through patience and prayer for indeed Allah is with those who bear patience aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad